When you're looking for a solicitor to deal with your case, you don't just look for any solicitor, you look for the right solicitor. An expert who knows what he's doing can deal with your case the right way, achieving the best results. Hovaski Solicitors has more than 100 years of specialist experience serving the local community in immigration law, property law, human rights legislation, civil and criminal litigation, family law, employment law, Sharia law, business law, maritime and commercial law, providing professional legal services globally in Africa, Asia and Europe. Be assured, we'll be able to deal with your case the absolute right way with results. So contact us today by phone on 020-7739-7549 or go online at www.lethalpower.com Yep. Good evening. Welcome to Truth and Justice TV. Thank you for joining us once again. My name's Jennifer Obasaki and we're here this evening again to talk about some of the issues that are happening in our streets. It's been a very, very troubling week and weekend. Sadly, we have lost another two young people to knife crime over the weekend. Um, we are going to talk about that topic kind of adjacently to the main topics of today, which is going to be about special educational needs and exclusion from schools. Today, I have a very special guest. She is a lawyer, an advisor, who has more than 10 years experience in this field. And without further ado, her name is Mrs. Debbie Otumabo. Have I pronounced <laughs> no. Oh, shocking. Smack me. <laughs> it's Deborah Otubambo. Otubambo. Yes. See, us Nigerians, our names are so complicated, but what can we say? <laughs> so, this area now is under the spotlight, given yeah. especially what we're seeing in, this, in, in, this, in the news on a daily basis, sadly. Yeah. Um, but what's your experience, first of all? If people say, okay, she's got 10 years experience, who is she? What's she been doing? How would you respond? <laughs> well, I would respond by saying that my experience has primarily been within safeguarding in education. So I have been a safeguarding officer for 10 years across two secondary schools and one further education college where I have advocated for young people who have uh, come into you know, the schools having child protection concerns, um, family breakdowns and special educational needs. So my job has been to really advocate for them to ensure that they are kept within school. Now, many people who may not have a child with disabilities or have never had issues with the school may not realise the challenges that some parents may face. But when a child has special educational needs, what are the primary things that a parent should be entitled to? Because so many of Times, you know they're overwhelmed that's the one thing I can say if you're especially if they're working as well then to be given this whole new um, level of information uh, course of action that they have to take on top of dealing with other kids and their jobs can sometimes be quite challenging and sometimes they hit hurdles where professionals feel they should be doing one thing for their child and they feel that a different direction should be done in their child's best interest so what would you say to a parent as in, what are the key things that a, a parent needs to know if their child has special educational needs? Well, I think um, if your child has been diagnosed with some sort of disability or special educational needs, more than likely there should be an education healthcare plan that's put into place via the local authority. That plan, which was formerly known as the Statement of Special Educational Needs, should outline the child's um, challenges, but also their strengths, and it should also outline um, the provisions that that child needs, whether it's the input of um, a speech and language therapist, special educational, um, educational psychologist, a clinical psychologist, sometimes occupational therapist as well. It should outline all the different things that the, the local authority are going to put together in order to support that child because now it's an education healthcare plan mm. so it should all, also all incorporate. services yeah. should be incorporated and yeah. if parents feel they're not getting the fullest 
maybe the occupational therapist hasn't got back to um, the psychologist and therefore the, the plan's being delayed. What can the parent do? Or what key things, you know, if they've hit a brick wall, should they do? Well, every so often the school should be meeting anyway to discuss the needs of uh, the child. So to look at progress, um, depending on the school, that might be termly or every half term. And um, more than often parents should be invited in. Mm. Um, where that's not the case, then certainly they should be able to feed back upon the parent's request. Um, but the parent can call for attack, oh. uh, which is um, a team around the child meeting. Okay. If they feel that there are a number of concerns that they have, and these concerns are not being addressed. Yes, okay. So this tax should have the involvement of all the services and professionals involved with the child. So again, you might have a youth worker, you might have the social worker, you might have the educational psychologist and so on and so forth. It is the job of the SENCO, which is the Special Educational Needs Coordinator, to okay, invite everyone. the professionals, to have I them see. together, to discuss the concerns that the child is presenting within the school. The parents, too, can suggest they can call for that to happen. Or so you they need can to call do... for the attendees. They should, well, you if, should... if, if, if the SENCO is taking over, not communicating... Um, can the parents yeah. just put forward a list? These are the people that are involved yeah. with my child that I think should be at the, at the TAC yes, meeting. Yes, so the parent can say to the Tsenko, look, I want a TAC meeting. There might be a little bit of toing and fro oh, yeah. from that. <laughs> but, you know, ultimately the parent can say, I want a team around the child meeting and I want these people invited. Okay. If the Tsenko is not doing that and you're a parent like some parents that I know, you can go ahead and email and copy in those professionals and make them aware. Make them aware the meeting's happening, once even they if they're are, not invited. <laughs> yeah, so once they are aware, it's more than likely they will suggest their availability. Okay. And you've almost backed the Senko into a corner. So had he or she not wanted them to be present in, in the first instance, now that they are aware, it's almost what excuse do you have to give them not, not to be available. available. And then with the healthcare elements, um, especially when it comes down to services, things like, you know, the physical, um, uh, the physio, things that cost a bit additional, that are seen as by some healthcare professionals as additional, that might not be um, scheduled for the child, or there might not be a level of cooperation, mm -hmm. but maybe the parents realise that, look, the physical or uh, the physio is needed to help my child's posture and um, these additional services may not be core educational but they fall under healthcare and mm -hmm. I want them put in the plan. If if they if the parents feel they're being blocked, a, a particular service is being blocked, how can they put forward their position or make that case for their child? Well again I think if the child has a diagnosis, so say for example um, that the child has cerebral palsy and needs the input of a physiotherapist um, I think occupational health will make an assessment as to what the child needs. And mm. insofar as that has been, you know, um, named, then that should be put into the plan. Um, and then it's for the parent really to go to the local authority mm -hmm. and say, right, I feel that my child needs X, Y and Z. Mm -hmm. And it's for them to then relook at, at all the needs of the child and then put that within the plan. So a child might need, I don't know... Um, a wheelchair or, or what have you these things should really be put in place for the child's child preventive. might even need gadgets yeah, might need yeah. um tools if yeah. they're autistic or they've yeah. got speech requirements yeah. or visual impairment might need certain pieces of technology that will help them with their yeah. learning and they might have to make that case and when it comes down to being accepted into particular schools especially mainstream schools if a child has um uh, certain restrictions and certain schools feel they can't take the child or object to taking the child. What help can the parents expect or what? how can the parents challenge such a decision? Well, first of all, no school is allowed to say we are not going to take the child on the basis of their With needs. Disability, that's, that's discrimination. discrimination. <laughs> but I think in the instance where a, a school, where you name a school, so what happens when you have a child with an educational health care plan? You get to name a school. So you almost get first refusal, if you like. Okay. You say, I want my child to go to school X. Nine times out of ten, that child gets to go to school X, even if they're not necessarily within the catchment area. Um, if that school takes the um, EHCP, reads through it and says, oh, 
this child is wheelchair bound, but we don't have ramps and we don't have lifts. Mm. They're within their right to say, we can't meet the needs of this the child. child. So they're not discriminating against the child in that instance. They actually don't have the provisions, you know, readily available for the child. However, if the same child were to apply to, to school X and school X does have, you know, ramps and lifts, then there's no reason no for that excuse. school, there's no excuse for that school mm -hmm. to be able to say, we cannot accommodate this child unless they're oversubscribed. And this can be private schools, this can be mainstream schools. Mainstream schools. So with, with independent schools, it's slightly different because mm -hmm. independent schools have to first make an offer to uh -huh. the child. And the local authority are not in a position to force an independent school to accept your child. Now, that's one of the areas that I've seen some appeals and things happening when children haven't been accepted. So when it is an independent school, you've got to look at their admissions policy and the school has to make the child an offer. And if, a ch if the school does not make a child with a child an offer, you can then look for the reasons why yeah. and try and go through the appeals policy. So it's yeah. important for parents to know the difference. But... Let's move on to um, exclusions. Now, the reason why I've decided to sort of push this to exclusions as well as, um, let me say, gang-related activity prevention is because even this morning I was watching um, the news and there was the correlation between children who are excluded and those who fall into uh, crime through gang violence because of being groomed because they're not in school. And um, there was the case of the young boy that was shot in East London, and it's been revealed that he was also excluded from school, and that's one of the reasons why um, he was not in school and doing school activities, and um, the correlation is there statistically anyway. So how do you feel about this? Um, when a child is at the risk of being excluded, and it can be for a variety of reasons, but if we talk about some of the common reasons children are excluded... And then what parents can do. So yeah. what are some of the common reasons children are excluded? I think the most common reason is for disruptive behaviour. Mm -hmm. or uh, Persistent disruptive behaviour. Yes. Or behaviour that is deemed to be um, risky. So if a child is violent and at risk to the wider school and staff, and that child has had a number of fixed term exclusions, then it's more than likely that the school will look to move that child on via a um, permanent exclusion or at times a managed move a managed move simply it's almost the same as an exclusion but just doesn't get recorded the same way right. so what they do is they will um, at times go to a panel which in some boroughs is known as a fair access panel they'll meet with another head teacher and say right can we move this child to your school? Really? Yeah. So students who are problematic can be interswapped between schools? They can be, yes. And uh, are parents invited to this panel? Um, to my knowledge, I don't think so, but I think parents are able to give Representations? their... Representations? Yes, to, to you know give their view prior to this happening. Okay. Um, I know of parents who have been you know coerced into accepting this and being told unless you accept this, we're going to exclude. And parents are automatically thinking, oh, if my child's excluded, it goes on. I have no alternative. Yes, or it goes on his or hers report. Mm. Let me do this managed move, and then it looks better. People need to be aware that you're entitled to a fair hearing, which means if there's a decision being made at any level about your child, there must be the right for you to put forward some submissions and some representations or your viewpoint. So never feel that you cannot make um your submissions whether it's done as simple as in writing by email and like this read out or prior to it going these are my points make sure that's read uh, that's if you're not um, invited or allowed to be at that level of meeting if you're in, allowed to be at the level of meeting always ask if you're entitled to bring along representation even if it's representation that's there just to record there are some meetings that lawyers go to with parents where they're not allowed to make representations, but they're allowed to record what's happening. So remember, if you're a parent and you're going there trying to make submissions, emotional, you might not be able to take down everything people are saying. Yeah. So it is key for you to either have a note taker 
or your lawyer help you with the submissions that are to be read out before you get there or there to take notes. Yes. Thank you for that. Then, um, again, we, we've talked about some of the reasons for exclusion and disruptive behaviour. And, you know, with some children that come from challenging backgrounds or vulnerable children that are in situations of either domestic violence yeah. or having mental health issues or undiagnosed issues, yeah. there can be outbursts for different reasons. Absolutely. So, um, again, if parents feel that their children may need additional evaluation or support, what should they do? Well, it's funny that you, you mentioned that because actually th those children, the most vulnerable children, you know, with, with home life situations are you know more likely to be um, excluded, excluded than anyone yeah. else and believe it or not children with um, special educational needs are you know the the um, number of, of exclusions that they face are a lot higher than mm. typical children and again this might be because of uh, behavior challenges that they present which contradict the school's behavior policy um school in the first instance when these behaviors are being presented should really put things of support in place so they should look to external agencies and see if the local authority has um, some sort of a mentor um, say if there's a key worker within the school they could present them to some schools have counselors mm -hmm. um, so they can refer um, the child on to a school counselor um, they can also refer the child on to the safeguarding officer who can meet with the child to see if there are underlying issues as to what is c causing this behaviour. If that is the case and a referral was made to social services, then there will be some sort of meeting that takes place so that we can look at what's actually going on. If the child is, uh, at times the child may be subject to a child protection plan yes. or a child in need plan because there are things going on in the home. So there might be domestic violence, there might be substance misuse. Really, the, the school should not be excluding children who are coming from backgrounds They like shouldn't that be excluding the most home, vulnerable. No. Home is not a safe haven in that respect. But unfortunately, it does still happen. Mm. The role of the safeguarding officer should be to advocate for the child from the school's perspective. So you're relaying to the other professionals, you know, where the school's coming from mm. in terms of what your policy is. But you're also there to say what you can do as a school to support, support that, that child. child. Is there a conflict there, though, between the safeguarding officer and the school? Is that why, to be honest with you, is that why there's the need for some objective input? Because sometimes the safeguarding officer has in the back of their mind, this school has st statistics that it wants to maintain, has the past record it wants to maintain, etc., has the punctuality record it yeah. wants to maintain. So this problematic child... It might be easier if this child's not on the books. That, that yeah. you know, that, so is there a conflict? There certainly has been a conflict <laughs> when I've worked as a safeguarding <laughs> officer because, you know, there's the, the side of you that says, look, we mm. need to be doing X, Y, and Z for this child, but you're also there to present the school's ethos mm. and to say, well, we have a behaviour policy and this is what we accept and this is what we won't accept. So, mm. you know, you're wearing two hats, really. And that's where the difficulty really is. Some schools are a lot better than others, course, and it yeah. really just depends on whom the head teacher is and their level of understanding when it comes to safeguarding and SEN. Once you have a good head teacher and you've got a SENCO who is able to liaise effectively with the head teacher, you're going to have a better outcome. Whereas if you have a head teacher whose stance is uh, attainment, attainment, attainment in terms of you know grades and, and mm. what we get with our stats, then unfortunately, unless you're pulling in the eights and nines or the A's and the B's, it's a lot easier to just simply get rid of a child who's not going to benefit your stats. So we're going to be taking phone calls and that's going to, the numbers on the screen. So just before we round off an exclusion, um, to let you know that we will then be moving into really gang violence and prevention. If your child is excluded, and is not in school, what can you do? And if you find that your child is being pulled in the wrong direction, again, what can you do? We'll be discussing that. So the final word and exclusion, what three points can you give a parent who's having difficulty and um, their child is giving them tr trouble, is no angel, but needs help. The child is being threatened out of the one stable environment that takes up the majority of their day of school. What can the parents do? I think if your child is at risk of an exclusion, talk to their head of year, talk to um, their key worker, safeguarding officer if there is one, 
don't be ashamed to reach out for help. I think a lot of parents, you know, almost want to shy away from receiving help from services. But I think prevention is much better than cure. If there's a problem there, reach out to the school and say to them, look, can we have a meeting? Can we try implementing this? You as a parent also have the authority to contact services outside of the school. So reach out for a mentor, um, reach out to your local community, um, you know, whether you belong to a church or a mosque, reach out to friends and family and really try and get as many positive um, role models in your child's life. Activities as well really help if you can keep the child busy, if there are activities for your child to do outside of school, um, you know, whether it's sports, whether it's dance, whether it's music, anything that's going to be a positive influence on the child would really help. Yeah. Now, thank you again for all this wonderful advice. But we'll be talking after the break, ladies and gentlemen, about what to do if your child is involved in gang activity. It's a very serious topic. And as you've just heard, there is no stigma here. If you need help, you reach out and get it. So we'll see you after this very short break, break with some words of advice. See you in a moment. When you're looking for a solicitor to deal with your case, you don't just look for any solicitor. You look for the right solicitor. An expert who knows what he's doing can deal with your case the right way, achieving the best results. Hovaski Solicitors has more than 100 years of specialist experience serving the local community in immigration law, property law, human rights legislation, civil and criminal litigation, family law, employment law, Sharia law, business law, maritime and commercial law, providing professional legal services globally in Africa, Asia and Europe. Be assured we'll be able to deal with your case the absolute right way with results. So, Contact us today by phone on 020-7739-7549 or go online at www.lethalpal.com. Thank you for staying with us. Welcome back. We're talking about special educational needs, school exclusions, and what to do if your child is excluded and actually at risk of being groomed or already on the curse of gang activity. My name's Jennifer Obasaki, and my guest today is Debbie. Now, Deborah, if somebody wants to get hold of you, that's something people are probably listening, thinking, okay, I need to talk to her. My child has special educational needs. I'm having challenges or my child is being excluded or at risk of being excluded, I want someone to make submissions. How can they get hold of you? Well, I am at Obasaki Solicitors, so you can contact me there. I'm there Monday through to Thursday, 9 to 5. So I'm They can available. just give you a call. Yeah, give me a call. And book a consultation, yeah. and you're ready to help. Fantastic. Now, exclusions. What if we're at this point where child is not controllable mm -hmm. child is not cooperating and has been asked to leave school where do we go what can the parents do okay well it's highly unlikely that a child will receive a permanent exclusion straight away mm -hmm. so it's something that escalates i see um mm -hmm. usually this starts with a fixed term exclusion and even before that really the school do have the power to do something called an internal exclusion where they're in, if you like, isolation within the school, but they're not formally off school. Mm -hmm. So they're still on roll. They're being educated separate from their peers. I guess that does, does it all depend on the scale yeah. of what's happened? Yeah. But as a parent, when the, the school is trying to decide what's happening, mm. can you make representations? Well, so what should happen? Mitigation <laughs> for your child. You can, of Please, course. Don't of course, as a, as a parent, as a parent, mm -hmm. you know, you should always advocate for your child. Um, you know, that's my number one rule because you are your child's exactly. biggest and only advocate, if you like. Um, if the child has done something that warrants a, a fixed term exclusion, which means we don't want the child on the premises mm. for the time being, um, be mindful if you are told to keep your child home to cool off for a period of time. That amounts to an illegal exclusion. S mm. Schools are not supposed to do that. They're not supposed to They're do not that. supposed to do that. Either they're going to exclude or they're not going to exclude. Sometimes they'll ask you to keep your child off because by them putting down that they've actually given your child an exclusion, 
it affects their stats. So you might feel like, oh, you know, they're doing me a favor. I it's see. not going to go on my child's record. But actually, it's to help themselves. And it's actually known as an illegal exclusion. So if, they, if you've been told to keep your child off following an incident, you need to go to the school and say, either you exclude my child or I'm sending my child in. School should wow. then come back and say, right, we're, we're excluding. However, only the head teacher has the power to, to exclude the child. So you need to receive a letter from, from the, the head, head teacher, teacher stating that the child has been excluded for a number of days for this reason. I see. When the child then comes back, parents will be asked to come in with the child to meet with the child's um, head of year and perhaps a, a number, another member of staff. As for a reintegration meeting. So you talk about the incident that took place which led to the exclusion. Mm -hmm. You sign some f form of a contract and, you know, to decide, you know, what the best approach is to ensure that this incident doesn't take place again. Depending, on, again, on what the incident was, sometimes the school might say, right, um, we're going to allow the child to return to school, but for a number of days, you know, we want gradual them to, yeah, th so there's, there's a gradual sort of reintroduction back into mainstream schooling, mm -hmm. um, you know, because they've been off for a number of time and, you know, it will unsettle them and what have you. Mm -hmm. So that's usually what happens with the school. So for, for, for the viewers out there, those are good tips, but what if I say, um, yeah, it happens, child has been permanently excluded. What next? What are the options? So if a child has been permanently excluded, then you have a certain amount of time to appeal. I think that's subject to the school's policy. So for some schools, so it might be 10 days, 14 policy. days. You have to look at their, their exclusion policies. You can, of course, up until that point, you know, a, a number of things would have been taken place. So it shouldn't come to a surprise to you that the child has been permanently excluded because mm. again it doesn't happen overnight so you would have had a number of fixed term exclusions ranging from three days five days ten days eight 18 days and then the school says right we've had enough had yeah. we're going to permanently exclude um you can appeal and you make your um, submissions to the school as well as to the local authority and that then has to be brought to panel and it's looked at a number of things will be taken into consideration. So again, does the child have um, special educational needs? Are there safeguarding concerns? Um, you know, what schools are available? Um, and then also, you know, has the child gone to approve a pupil referral unit? Is, that, is there one available for the child to go to? So a number of things will be taken into consideration. But as a parent, it is really important that you get your submissions through and you do, at the very least, try to go through the appeal panel. So parents, if you think that um, after exclusion there are alternatives, they are very few. Now the proofs, there are not enough um, proofs around. So, so these pupil referral units, many of them have a limited... Uh, educational spectrum so it's important that if there's a way to appeal if there's a way to get a different outcome apart from removing the child from mainstream education that you actually do try to take it um, as, so far as the child is not being adversely affected within mainstream education if your child needs additional support then it's important again that you do try to get that additional support for your child um, there is no stigma that should be attached to you getting help for your child if your child needs a therapist damn go get one <laughs> you know yes. speak to the doctor speak to the um child mental health team and do get one it's important that you appreciate if your child has challenging behavior that you do need support yeah. especially if you are not qualified to deal with your child's challenging behavior yeah. um there, there are key things that you need to realise as a parent, even if you are busy, even if you need to make rent or that mortgage. The fact is, if you don't parent your child, we've seen that these streets are ready to do it for you. Now, a lot of the children who are excluded, sadly, don't have any activity. Yeah. Mum and dad or mum or dad alone is out to work or the mm. carer, whether it's a grandparent, aunt or relative, mm. the carer is out to work and that child is left at home and then the streets come yeah. and it's a case of going out people are ready to groom these children 
Are there any preventative measures that the parent can take until the child gets into a PRU or gets into some form of alternative education? That's a, a really tricky question because every family dynamic is different and, you know, people have financial commitments. So like you said, there's rent that needs to be made. If you're living in private rented accommodation, at times these can be extortionate, especially mm. if it's not social housing. If you've got a mortgage, you know, what do you do? You have to work. Sometimes you have to do overtime. And can um, I just add, and if you're a vulnerable migrant and you have no recourse to public funds... You yeah. have to work. Yeah. <laughs> so it means that, you know, there is no alternative and, yeah. and then there's additional burden on the family of yeah. having to pay for application yeah. fees. Yeah. Just highlighted that because a lot of the um, issues that we're having with children on the streets are to do with mm -hmm. children from in diaspora communities. And that means they're second, third generation migrant families that do have these additional factors that surround them. Yeah. But yeah, it's... It, I know that there's a lot of um, gang prevention project schemes yeah. that are out there, but are there, is there anything specifically tailored for children who are on that cusp? Well, again, I think it depends on your local authority. You need to really actively look and see what your borough offers. Um, in some boroughs, they do offer um, you know, youth services, although we know that you, the youth services had been quite cut. The there are still a few... Yeah. Um, youth clubs that are still available that your you know your child can access um you know there you, you have to think creatively is there a neighbor that mm. can support you um are there friends and family that you mm. can rotate and i'll have your child on this day this evening you have my child on that evening mm. um i think as parents we it's our duty it's our job to be really creative to ensure that our child or our children are not left home alone between the hours of, you know, four to six, which is, you know, what we know statistically to be the most troubling times where stabbings are actually occurring. It's, mm. it's in the daytime, you know, it's while parents are still at work. So um, it's just really thinking um, creatively. And, and, and I don't want to sound unempathetic at all, because I know that there are a lot of single parents, be you mum or dad, who, you know, are the sole carers for the child. And financially, you've got to make ends meet. You've got to keep a roof over your head. You've got to keep food in your child's tummy. But you've also got to keep that child alive. Mm. And with what's happening in our streets today, it really is about thinking creatively and, and working amongst yourselves. If yeah. you need to go part-time and, and you budget... So oh, you, you yes. hold back on, you know, you're not shopping in certain air mm -hmm. shops anymore. You're going and you're buying economy, you know, food for the next however, then you and need then to do as it. as parents, you also have to remember that you're allowed time off for family. Yeah. And so you can approach your employer to say, look, I'm having a family emergency. Uh, you, you do have to obviously qualify for it and it can't be frivolous. But at the same time, if you say to your direct line manager or your HR, I need time off i'm having a parenting issue they are obligated to actually give you that time or give you they're obligated to consider being flexible in giving you that time so do not think that you know it's the it's there are no alternatives get some help get some advice some of the statistics are staggering that we've seen over the weekend which is um 27 thousand young people are considered to be within gang activity and we're talking about children who are encouraged to take up gang activity from the ages of 10 9 delivering <coughs> excuse me packages because they're seen as below the age of criminal culpability and some of the police officers i've spoken to say that some of these children they see regularly so one of the questions i ask is if you're a parent and your child is um, out of control, yeah. still coming home whenever they want to, but out of control. What can you do? Yeah. Can you reach out to certain organisations? The police maybe have picked your child and brought them home a couple of times, yeah. even had them interviewed. What next? Again, that's a hard one, and, and I think that's down to the individual, really. Um, but, I, uh, but as a parent, I would be reaching out to anyone who will hear me. Um, so these intervention authority. projects so you, if, if we say to people okay look you should have local gang intervention services and you should have also family intervention services the issue is if the child is not willing to engage in them many of them step back and that's a problem yeah. 
they're supposed to still engage with the rest of the family. Social services are also supposed to do an assessment on the family as to what additional support you need, whether that's housing, whether that's a move out of the area. And what we're finding is we're finding that that is not happening. When the services step back, parents are giving up. And when parents are giving up, children are falling into, falling deeper into gang activity. Yeah. So one of the things that we'll say to you is you must insist on a proper assessment, getting the referral to social services if the intervention service is not working. You've gone to um, a gang exit charity or you've gone to a gang prevention charity. They've contacted you, written all your numbers, written all your names, tried to get a meeting with your child and your child is not engaging. Next thing is, well, there's a risk to a child. So social services, you're asking your school, you're asking your uh, community anybody as even the the charity itself or intervention service to make that referral to social services and because these things are not done instantly you have to then be ready to wait for the wheels to turn and in that same time be trying to get support in managing your child's behavior mm. and if your child's behavior is not being managed to try and document what's happening yourself so that when eventually somebody from social services does tell yeah. you look this on this day this happened on this day Another thing happened. Um, the other thing is um, what I've also observed is police are not using their powers to the best of their extent. I don't know why that is mm. again. If a child is arrested and has three or four mobile phones in their possession, why are officers not getting the necessary injunctions or orders to find out the numbers on those phones? Uh, why are the police not getting the necessary injunctions or orders to stop the, the young person from associating with certain people? Curfews. I was going to say curfews. I think that's a massive one. I, think, I don't understand. I think we're in a crisis and that the police need to call for, you know, a, a nationwide curfew Well, at you the know, moment. when we, they, there was the correlation and ex, uh, similarity that was drawn between um, girls who were being sexually exploited on mass level and nobody did nothing and this level of gang violence that's happening and nobody's doing nothing. They say mo money's being pumped into uh, community activities to prevent gang um, children being uh, groomed and, and gang activity. But how is it being used? How? Mm -hmm. How are you? Pr how are these organisations? Where are the checks and monitors as to where and how the money's being used to prevent? And the prevention is as you say is is better than the cure but i'm not seeing enough being done i'm not seeing it enough youth activities being funded in order to prevent and um the, instead what we're finding is the growing numbers and that's rather concerning so with police powers if you feel that the local police officers can be doing more to prevent your child from going out from associating with people from having three or four mobile phones, then you do it. You ask the police to take action. You sit down with the community officer and you outline that you would like a, an order put on your son and say why. There are youth offending teams. If your child is constantly being, um, <laughs> let me say, addressed or having to face uh, uh, meetings with the youth offending teams, then you outline as a parent what you would like to happen in order to curb your child's behavior there's no shame in it you is you know it's down to you to be your child's best advocate and i continue to say that and um the final thing i'll say if your child is a teen with a bank account and has money and it's not coming from you you need to also outline where that money is coming from rather than sit down and think okay my child asked for those shoes and i wasn't able to get it or my child asked for that game and suddenly they've got it and you've not asked where these hundreds of pounds have come from. Mm. You have to be responsible. You know, I think um, on Facebook last year, there was the guy that um, gave a video about going to court with a parent to support a parent and the child got sentenced. And as they were coming out of the court, and it's a, a, t a child that was not even 20 or so, the child's BMW was outside the court and the mum was going, how am I going to get this car? This car costs how many thousand pounds? I'm going to get home. And I was like, hold on a minute. You didn't even buy that car for the child. 
responsibility. Mm. And this is it. Just to add to that, the signs are there. If your child is coming home with items that you know you have not purchased and your child is 14, 15, 16 years old and you know they don't have a Saturday job, <laughs> that question needs to be kicked in. Yeah. Where are you getting this from? Because that's the sign. The other thing is it's not... And, you know, there's this um, issue that I've noticed, which is it's not uh, exclusive to one ethnicity. Yes. Whether you are African, whether you are West African, East African, Caribbean, uh, European, Portuguese, <laughs> South American, the gangs will groom your child. Even if they're good, plain old English children, mm. They will groom your child because your child is just a means to an end. Yeah. They will turn your child out. Whether it's slowly they notice that you leave at a certain time. Yeah. Whether it's slowly that they know that your child is seen as a good child, goes to church every Sunday. So his house won't get raided. We can keep the guns and drugs there. <laughs> you know, That's also happening. You're finding people from all different classes of society. Gangs know no class. They don't have no class. Whether you think you're a middle class family and it's not going to touch you or your child is not at risk of exposure, forget it. They can still get to you. This is the, the thing. And um, sadly, many families are not realizing that uh, the risk is right on their doorstep. Mm. And that's deeply concerning because you look at the news and you should realize that um, it's a fifth, if you're in London and if you're in any inner city right now, they say it's a 50-50 chance because of the level of gang activity as to whether your child actually falls or becomes susceptible, susceptible to gang activity and grooming. And that can be whether your child actually falls to be part, is on the periphery, has friends associated with them. And sometimes you hear about children being shot because uh, they were sadly the un 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 unintended victim. Uh, the, the victim was actually somebody who was close to them or they were with the same person the other thing is you have this crime of joint enterprise so again if your child goes along gets told oh we're going down the road to meet um jimmy and the whole idea is to go down there and bottle or knife jimmy and your child didn't know that was just called along to make up the numbers your child can again still be charged with the crime so it's essential for you to know who your child is hanging around with. Absolutely. One of the things that we, we've um, discussed as parents and a tactic that we've decided to do is also form WhatsApp groups for your, your child's circle of friends, parents. Why? Because you want to know if your child has not come home on time, an immediate way to contact everybody or every friend's home where your child is likely to be so that you know if they're not within that group, of uh, people's homes that there's a problem yes. so other strategies that people might want to take up to try and um, let's say curb or prevent uh, the child falling down the wrong path can you think of anything else that might be helpful to parents I mean I think the, the whatsapp group is, is a good idea mm -hmm. I think always knowing who your ch you know your children's yeah, friends are, are I, I think that's crucial yeah. um, you know getting to know that their parents, you know, because you don't know what families, you only know your family, <laughs> you don't know what family they're going into when they say they're going to John's house. Mm. Um, I think, you know, just having apps, if, if they've got an iPhone, knowing where they knowing are, where yeah. they are. So I think something like Where's the my iPhone, iPhone has the, yeah. you know, where you can, <laughs> it's trace not a chip, them. but you can trace <laughs> them. Um, I think also having, you know, installing the Uber app, on the phone is, is, is very useful son, so yeah. <laughs> god forbid if they needed to get away Always. very quickly you know they can you know call the uber or you know you can call one for them and you can trace where they yeah. go so if they're saying they're going to john's house and that postcode is such and such you've said you've put them in the uber there <laughs> and you know when they've oh, got god, there yeah. and when they're coming back um mm -hmm. just really trying to communicate as as much as possible and I think really forming that relationship with your child where... Open communication. It's open communication, no matter how shocked it might be to hear the things that they're coming out with, just let them know that they can always come and talk to you because otherwise they're talking to the people out, outside and, and that they aren't nine times out of ten being given the right advice. Those people outside want to use your child. And if you allow those people to have a bigger influence than you, then they've 
they succeeded. It's as simple as that. I know that it's very, very hard given the strains on our time and our resources and the, the financial commitments that we all have. However, what we're seeing day in, day out is the results of, um, one, the fact that children feel that they cannot turn to their parents for one reason or another, whether they've been groomed to the extent that they cannot come to you, that's one thing. And then two, we're seeing the lack of resources in pursuing those responsible for the grooming. Whether that, that lack of resources is due to lack of knowledge, lack of know-how, but I do feel that the police, there is a bit of a, tr uh, a void with uh, them knowing how to use, best utilise the intelligence that will come from a young person who is involved in gang activity in order to catch the groomer. And I'm not sure why that is. <laughs> Uh, when a child comes to them, as I've said, child gets arrested, charges may not stick due to the age or due to the fact that what the child is carrying is too small or the, the evidence is not so solid. But that child clearly is being used. So why are you not then asking the parent who might be paying the phone bill for um, a authority to look into who that child's calling, where that child's going? I'm, I'm, I'm actually boggles by why the police don't use the their powers and their intelligence a lot more maybe the the numbers are not worrying enough for them <laughs> I, I hope that's not the reason why I just hope that there's a void in as I say the education uh, or knowledge and power that they have but hopefully we've got to be positive hopefully things will get better hopefully, hopefully things will get better now it's this issue about asking for help, I do want to stick with it because, as I said, it's not a case of this being particular to one um, element of the of, of, of the community. It's not a, an African problem. It's not a, a Caribbean problem. It's not, a, you know, an Asian problem. I was saying um, to one of the um, officers that I spoke to that you've actually seen that gang activity has changed over the years. And I... I kind of wrote an article about this last year. Gangs are, are now collaborating, if you don't know. You, you, once upon a time, you had Turkish gangs, uh, <laughs> African yeah. boys, yeah. Caribbean circle of boys, yeah. and English boys, but now they actually work yeah, together. together. Um, yeah. Some of them obviously have their clashes. That's why you have the turf wars with the stabbing of you're in my area, don't yeah. step into my area. You also have the postcode wars between the different gangs. Yeah. But... Um, when it comes down to actually the economy and the psychology of gangs, that is something that I feel there's not enough education on those who are supposed to be operating in policy and enforcement know about. Um, I'm not sure whether they need a street education, but we're ready to train them. But <laughs> uh, but it's, 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 it's a worrying, worrying thing. We've spoken a lot on this topic, but one of the things that if people are going to be going into the community for help, especially because... Um, maybe social services are not there or, or haven't come yet or the, the child is not engaging it is still important for you to try and make sure that if it's not a family member that that person is DBS checked It's uh, one of the things is when you are looking for help predators will still see you as vulnerable and the family is vulnerable so if you're going into church as well as having your prayers which obviously you do need it is important for you to also be focused that if people you're introducing to your child are actually um checked and qualified to really be around your child because you're in a vulnerable state yes when families are vulnerable um it, is there any like checklists or points you can give them not to be so uh, you can be eager for help but at the mm. same time you've got to be a bit a little bit focused yeah as to who it is why it is and if there's a cost yeah. i think who what what is the end result going to be and is there a cost because yeah. sometimes you don't want to sit down and go to somebody then suddenly there's a a bill at the end yeah. and you weren't expecting it you yeah. know <laughs> that that can be additionally burdensome yeah. for some you know for some families now our phone lines will be open um I, they should be open now in case you have any questions you can call in if not you can email us. You can email info at obasikisolicitors.com. That's info at obasikisolicitors.com. And 
as you've heard, she'll be ready to sit down with you, have a consultation, give you some objective advice, whether it's to do with special educational needs or whether it's to do with exclusions. If it does come down to the sensitive issue of grooming and gangs, feel free to give me a call. I do have some connections with um, some intervention projects. And at the same time, I'm able to sort of sit down and give you some candid advice because before I actually opened my law firm, the one thing I did a lot of was criminal work. We still do private criminal work, but the one thing I did was a lot of criminal work throughout North London. And um, believe me, the streets in North London where I've grown up have changed so dramatically. It's, it's actually quite sort of frightening. Now, next week, we are going to be talking about some of these further topics. We will be still sticking with this issue of um, gang violence because the numbers that are being taken from our community are quite staggering. And um, until there's a sea change and until we feel that we've empowered families and the community to make sure there is that sea change, we have to still keep it at the forefront. And until there is, um, a, let me say, a bit more attention and effectiveness from uh, policy and decision makers, we're going to continue talking about this. And um, when it comes down to um, the issue of knife crime and families, last week we spoke about some of the help that victims can get in relation to uh, being victims of crime. When it comes down to families, there's compensation that you can get from the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board. But apart from that, the other issue is if you need help with regards to a move out of the area, there is additional support you can get from uh, our office in relation to your housing, and that can often be a problem. Sadly, if social workers are not able to sit down and do an assessment in time, or you feel that you need to challenge the assessment, people often don't know what to do. Mm. Are there any recommendations you can give to families who want to challenge the, like, the social workers' reports? Or assessments complain 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 yeah. complain mm. and there's a co there's always a complaint policy somewhere mm -hmm. and you know everyone has a boss mm -hmm. and every boss has a boss on top of them and you know you can go to your local MP you can go to your local councillors they're there for a reason um, make contact with them knock on as many doors as you can so that somebody will eventually let you in mm -hmm. um, I think certainly with with the housing um, being able to move that is a that is a major problem for a lot of people because it's not so easy to just pick up and mm. you know move elsewhere. I think there's a, a housing crisis across the country anyway. But um, utilize things like Home Swapper, mm -hmm. go on Gumtree, see if you can do mutual exchanges, you know, privately as well as using the um, the services that the local authority are providing. I think you've got to be as creative as possible when it comes to these things. And don't limit yourself. You know, outside of London, there's yeah. a lot of good fresh air. Though they have said that the, the levels of gang crime is also escalating in the uh, suburbs now, obviously because of county lines, but also because there's better recording and re reporting and recording of that type of information. But don't let that deter you. Mm. If you know your immediate environment is not healthy is risky and is pulling your child down, yeah. then seek to look for greener and better, safer pastures for you and your family. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for joining us today You're on Truth welcome. and Justice TV. And thank you oh. for being my guest. <laughs> you thank must you, come back. You. I will, of course, anytime. Definitely. Thank you. It's going to be amazing to hear more from you. Now, it is essential that if you are facing problems and you feel you're not getting support, that you go to your local community officer to get help. There's also Crime Stoppers that's out there. As you're aware, two children lost their lives this weekend. I say children, you might say young adults. As far as I'm concerned, these lives are being lost needlessly. And if we as a community don't take action, then unfortunately we're going to lose a lot more lives before there's a stem in what we're seeing. We've also seen that there are a lot of groups out there. Some of these groups are lacking funding. Find out what your MP is doing to support gang 
prevention work that's being done in your environment. If your MP is not making sure funds are going into effective projects, then there's a problem. Then look at the checks and monitoring that the projects are doing. They're doing projects and who is it affecting? If you are a parent that needs help, do not be afraid of your child. You need to ask for the support from the police. And if the police don't give you the help, please do feel free to give me a letter so that I can try and help you make submissions. There are things that you should be doing to make sure that your child is not associating with the wrong people. If it's challenging for you, then there may be steps that you have to take legally to make sure that your child stays home. There may be things that you have to do to make sure that your child has no phone. There may be things that you need to do to make sure that your child cannot go online on Snapchat and on certain apps to make sure they're, you know, they're not doing the wrong things with the wrong people. And as I've said, do not be afraid to ask for help. There is no stigma in asking for help. There's no stigma in saving your child's life. Okay. Well, thank you again for joining me. I look forward to seeing you again next week on Truth and Justice TV. So be good. And if you cannot be good, be careful. Stay blessed. When you're looking for a solicitor to deal with your case, you don't just look for any solicitor. You look for the right solicitor. An expert who knows what he's doing can deal with your case the right way, achieving the best results. Kovaski Solicitors has more than 100 years of specialist experience serving the local community in immigration law, property law, human rights legislation, civil and criminal litigation, family law, employment law, Sharia law, business law, maritime and commercial law, providing professional legal services globally in Africa, Asia and Europe. Be assured, we'll be able to deal with your case the absolute right way with results. So contact us today by phone on 020-7739-7549 or go online at www.lethalpower.com. When you're looking for a solicitor to deal with your case, you don't just look for any solicitor, you look for the right solicitor. An expert who knows what he's doing can deal with your case the right way, achieving the best results. Kovaski Solicitors has more than 100 years of specialist experience serving the local community in immigration law, property law, human rights legislation, civil and criminal litigation, family law, employment law, Sharia law, business law, maritime and commercial law.